Happy Easter, everybody. Well, if you're back in church here for the first time in a while, or maybe even some, first time here at St. John's ever, you picked a perfect weekend here because we're beginning a brand new a five-week series for the season of Easter called Brand New. How appropriate during this time where we have hopes and aspiration post-COVID. For the past couple of years, I've been preaching in multi-week series like this in order to present a general kind of topic and then delve deeper into it over the course of several weeks. We love new people. So it's so great to see a full church today. And we all love new things, if you think about it. What kind of new things do you like? You know, it could be a simple thing. Things like freshly cut, cut spring grass and that nice smell or Easter flowers. You might love this uh, display of Easter flowers for me have been up here at the altar for uh, um, about uh, four hours now uh, combined, even this, just this morning. I'm getting vertigo because the pollen's getting into my head here. So, but you may like uh, stylish things. You know, your Easter outfit is this so fabulous. You look so wonderful. Every single one of you. <laughs> or maybe you like big and bold things. You know, that new car the new kitchen, the new super expensive set of golf clubs, new house. Maybe you just, uh, you know, uh, like uh, new adventures, new uh, vacation, new possibilities in all kinds of things in life. I like the, the new smell of books. When you open up a new book, I just love that. I want to show you a little girl for whom everything is new. This is my niece, Annalise. So she's three years old. It isn't, isn't it wonderful to just see a little child and see through their eyes how they see everything new? It's just so wonderful. Well, I'm very excited along with the family because she's going to see new things in a place, let's just say, a magical kingdom where she's going to be a princess for a whole week. So I'm going to be with her in a week's time along with my family. Brand new. Exciting. So anyway, what are the kind of brand new things that you like and enjoy in your life? Depends on your interests and your personality. There's not a moment where we're, most of us are not thinking about something new. Something new for your job or your career. Some new ideas, some new initiative. Something new for school, activities in school. Something new in your relationships. Maybe something new for your married life. Something new to strengthen the relationship between you and your kids. Something new that's maybe just entertainment or distraction, but also new things that will revive us and give us new dreams, fulfill our dreams for uh, going forward. And new things just give us hope. They give us hope for the future, even if it's just short term. And this leads me to the whole premise, the whole basis of this whole message series. That longing, that desire that you and I have for the new, for something new, is a gift from God. It's a gift from God that's given to us for a reason. And that's what we'll look at today. I'd like to look at the first reading for this Easter Sunday morning, the first reading from the scripture we heard from the story of the Acts of the Apostles. Well, the Acts of the Apostles is a book in the Bible, in the New Testament, that tells the story of the early church, the first followers of Jesus Christ after Easter, after Pentecost. New believers in Christ uh, gathered in great numbers. They came to believe in that good news, that the grave was conquered. And they were inspired to go out and make new disciples, to invite new people to a relationship with Jesus. Well, we skip ahead to Acts chapter 10. That's where we heard today. And we're introduced to a very interesting character. His name is Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. You can read about him in the whole of the chapter in Acts chapter 10. He was a centurion, which means that he was an officer in the Roman army. He commanded 100 soldiers. That's what the word centurion actually means. So he was a man of great stature and authority and responsibility. But not only that, Acts tells us that Cornelius was a very well-respected man. 
He was someone who was respected, not just among his fellow officers and soldiers, but among the Jewish people as well. He was very well liked and respected, and he had great success. He also gave to the poor. He had compassion. And Acts even tells us that he was a God-fearer. He believed in God, but not in the traditional sense. He wasn't a Jew, neither was he yet a Christ follower. So Cornelius is a great guy, very successful, but he's longing for something more. He's longing for something new. And maybe that's like you. Maybe that describes you. You've had great success in your career, in your business. You're very well respected among your family and your friends. You're seen as someone other people look up to. You know, you've lived a good life. You consider yourself a good person. Person, You're generous with other people. But maybe, just maybe, you are longing for something more. You're longing for something new. Well, you're like Cornelius then. So Cornelius, what he does is he prays. God answers his prayer, and it leads to him encountering the Apostle Peter. And this is a couple years probably after the resurrection. The Apostle Peter was the head of the church, and Cornelius arranges to have a meeting with Peter so that Peter comes to his house. And that's where we pick up today. So here's what happens. Peter said, then Peter proceeded to speak and said, In truth I see that God knows, shows no partiality. Rather in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. So God has led Peter and Cornelius to connect to have this connection here, Peter shares with him the good news. But this is actually, on Peter's part, a revelation for him. Peter's own eyes are open at this point. Because before this point, Peter, the head of the baby church, the new church, thought that God and religion and Jesus was just for church people. God and faith and religion was just for the insiders, which at the time were the pious Jews. So, Peter has this great revelation that God is also sharing the good news with the Gentiles, with the Romans, the pagans even. Notice again what Peter says. He says, in truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Well, my friends, that means that God wants a relationship with you too, no matter who you are. But Peter continues. He says, you know what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. So Peter is recounting for Cornelius the story of Jesus. You know, Cornelius probably was already very familiar with this story about Jesus and his death that had occurred a couple years prior because Jesus was very popular. Jesus was very well known in that whole region. Great crowds were attracted with, to him. If you read the gospel stories, it just sticks out on the page that people who are nothing like him liked him. People in the margin. They came to him not just for his miracle working and healing, but because he taught like no one ever had ever taught. He was an expert on life. He had a wisdom and an understanding that people just flocked to, to learn from him, to be guided by his great compassion. He helped people. He healed people. He loved. And then, of course, he caused trouble. He turned the tables on the religious understanding at the time, how God and religion was supposed to work. And for that, he got in trouble with the religious authorities. Eventually, it led to his execution by Pontius Pilate. So you know that story, and Cornelius probably did too. And as a Roman, as a pagan, he probably thought, you know, I respect Jesus as a, as a teacher. I think he was even a prophet of God. I see a great holiness in him, but really his death is sad. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm just sad to hear about it. 
And that attitude, there's nothing wrong with it. If Jesus was just a prophet, if Jesus was just a teacher, then his death really doesn't have anything to do with us. Well, that makes all the more important the next two verses. What Peter then says to Cornelius, which would have been absolutely shocking and astounding for him to hear. Here's what Peter says. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible not to all people, but to us, the witnesses, chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, to which Cornelius would have said, what, wait, what? Rose from the dead? You see, Cornelius, as part of that Roman and Greek culture, had a certain worldview. No matter what mythology or what philosophy that ancient Romans and Greeks followed, there was a sense that the human person was made up of body and soul, a duality, a composite of body and soul. And as such, ancient Romans and Greeks, no matter what philosophy or mythology they followed, believed that death was final. And it was not a bad thing. Death was a good thing. Because death allowed the, the soul to be released from the body. And that was considered good because the body and all matter was considered corrupt and decayed and sinful. And the whole aspiration of one's soul was to escape the body. That's what most Romans and Greeks believe. Jewish people believe something different. But this announcement of the resurrection of Jesus would have just shocked and shattered Cornelius' worldview and way of thinking. Jesus had already astounded people during his lifetime. He had performed miracles, great miracles, and the greatest miracle he did was actually, you might know this, the resuscitation, the raising of his friend Lazarus. His friend Lazarus, he raised from the dead, and that was one of the events that eventually led to a series of events that led to the conspiracy, and then his death, his suffering and death. The, the, the religious leaders thought, we cannot have this rabble-rouser doing this great power of God. We have to put him to death. And so Jesus was dead, but then this news shocked Cornelius. This news that Peter is sharing changes everything because he thought, Cornelius thought, that death was the ultimate reality. Death had the final word. And now the good news that Peter witnesses is that death is no longer the final reality and the, fi the last reality in the final word. Jesus Christ is the ultimate reality in the final word because in the whole of human history, before the resurrection, it was just death. After the resurrection, it's the possibility of new life. It's a whole new era in human history. And it's personal for Cornelius and for you, and for me. Well, my friends, in the resurrection of Christ and God raising up his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, that same power is available to us in faith. That same power is available to us. And here's the difference. You see, God raised his son from the dead as the first fruits. But in us, he begins inside. He begins inside our hearts and minds and soul and spirit and works outward. The resurrection is not just for heaven. It's not just for the end. It's for here and now. We can be made new in Christ. And that is the good news of the resurrection, that God desires that we be transformed over the course of our life with a new mind, a new heart, a new spirit, with a new attitude of life, new habits, New ways of thinking and acting. God, that's God's desire for you and me. And so, and so, that longing you have for new things, that desire that you and I all have for new things, whether it's a kitchen, whether it's a car, whether it's a house, whether it's a new job, a whole new dreams in your life, ultimately, that desire from something new is rooted in our desire for Christ. That longing is rooted in our desire for Christ. And that is why St. Paul says this, and this is the core verse for what I'm getting at today for the whole series. 
he says to the Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. My friend, no matter who you are, no matter if you're old or young, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, that power of newness in Christ is available to you and to me. We can be made a new creation in Christ. How amazing is that? Well, my friends, think about this. You know, if we get a gift, if we get a gift, the way we use the gift determines the benefit we get from the gift. In other words, you know, if someone gives you something, you don't use it, it doesn't benefit you much. The same with the gift of the risen life in Christ. We have to unpack it. We have to unwrap it. We have to exercise it in our life. Well, I just invite you to consider committing to this next five weeks of this message series because we're going to do this together. We're going to unravel a new, what it means to be a new creation in Christ, that new life in Christ. And each week we'll talk about a different topic. You know, uh, it's been an amazing gift to our parish that we've, uh, we've had so many new blessings. We have uh, small groups that are happening, uh, happened during Lent and during Easter. And last night we had seven people enter fully into the sacramental life of the church as baby disciples. All of us, no matter who we are, can unravel and unpack that new life in Christ. And maybe... There's something just stirring in your heart today. Something stirring in your heart. I want that. I want that. I don't know what that is, but I want it. I want that newness in Christ. Oh, the end of the story, the end of the story of Cornelius was that he and his household were baptized. And there's an ancient tradition on Easter Sunday that we're about to do. The ancient tradition where we get to renew the promises of our baptism, the vows of our own baptism. For most of you, and for myself, our parents made these vows or promises for us. But today on this Easter Sunday, we will be able to say, I do, and to make that recommitment, maybe even a commitment for the very first time to new life in Christ, to begin or begin anew this journey. And then after that, after we renew our baptismal promises, I'm going to make every effort to get you as wet as possible. And we, I'll go around and offer this sprinkling with the water of baptism. This water is not just any water. It was the water that we use for baptism of three people last night, the sacred waters of baptism, new life in Christ. Well, there's no pressure if you don't feel that calling this morning to make that commitment or recommitment to Christ in renewing our baptismal promises. No judgment is fine. But if you make that commitment, that recommitment, it might just give you a whole new perspective and a whole new, brand new start. Amen.